Really excited to be here with Miles Kessler. Uh, so Miles and I are in a private WhatsApp group of other um, business owners at a particular level of experience, and we have um, some really interesting and and helpful discussions there. And um, so Miles, I I just you know I love your presence, and I think it's I can't wait for this conversation. So Miles. Uh, just briefly, you know, you you are the director of the Integral Dojo, which is an online school for um, meditation, Aikido, etc. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot for us to discuss. As well as well as the integral as well as the Integral Dojo and TV. So there's a brick and mortar Integral Dojo, and there's an online Integral. Dojo. Right, 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 right. Okay, got it. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And um, so what we're going to talk about mainly today is meditation from a more unique perspective than maybe a lot of people mm -hmm. more unique, I think than the mainstream, but is there anything else you want to say about your background intro before we get going? No, I think that's good. I mean, okay. uh, you know, if it comes up in the context, we can speak. Sure. About it, but... Sure. Yeah. That sounds good. Okay. Let's so dive right in. Let's dive right in. Yeah, totally. Totally. Um, meditation, obviously mindfulness and meditation, huge topics and of interest probably to most of the people listening or watching here. And, um, and so, you know, just about everyone's maybe learn meditation in in the mainstream ways, basic ways, you know, pay attention to your thoughts, your breath, et cetera. Um, what do you bring to meditation that maybe is, it's a bit more unique um, than, than the mainstream question one uh, or question two, whichever one you want to address mm -hmm. first is what is integral right. since, since you, you lead the integral, integral dojo, uh, what is integral and how does that fit in with meditation? Okay. Well, let's, let's save that second question for later okay. because that's, okay. that's, a, that's a very different question. Than, than okay. Integral. So yeah. let's just, so maybe I will say a quick word about my background. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm, uh, I, I, I've practiced in the Buddhist tradition, the Theravada Buddhist tradition of, of mindfulness-based meditation, kind of hold a lineage in that, in that, uh, the Burmese Mahasi tradition. I actually have two lineages. I have a lineage in, in, in the Iwama tradition of Aikido, which I lived in and trained in Japan for eight years. And then uh, after that, I went on to, to study meditation. So I did this really kind of formal, traditional, hardcore uh, meditation practice uh, in Burma, which is very pre-modern context, very traditional context. Loved it. I, I was kind of trained in doing that when I was in Japan. And it was easy for me to, to make that make that transition into Burma. And I guess what's unique about what I'm bringing is, sorry, my daughter's over here. So you might hear a little bit of a background noise. <laughs> yeah, um, no, no, there's no noise. What, so go for it. Okay, cool, cool. So uh, what's unique, I suppose, is that I have this traditional context you know i actually you know i i i spent three years on meditation silent meditation retreat in a formal context with teachers and you know going through guidance and and um uh, so i have that and yet um i feel i don't teach from that perspective although i teach through that lens i definitely teach um uh what's called the progressive insight this kind of developmental um um, path that unfolds in the path in the practice of meditation but i do it in a very kind of postmodern way in a, in a way that's kind of just meets people where they at they're at here in the west and i i guess um i i work with people in three ways the first way i work with people is to help them just beginners or people who've been meditating for a while but they never did a formal practice to help them get established in a formal practice with kind of a formal methodology formal formal uh, mindfulness meditation technique that's number one uh, number two, I help people um, progress along the developmental stages of insight knowledge, that there is a blueprint to consciousness, that as we kind of take on spiritual technologies, um, we will kind of grow. <clears throat> spiritual maturity, spiritual growth follows along this kind of developmental path. doesn't really matter the tradition you're in. Different methodologies will unfold differently, but there is this kind of developmental path that um, people who are kind of get a little bit more on the deep end of meditation that's kind of really important for them to kind of know what's going on and where they're going and to know that there's a goal to the practice and and that they're moving in that direction uh that's really the most valuable i would say work that i do with people but it's always a minority of people who are kind of doing that and the third way that i work with people is how to integrate 
and bring uh, meditative insight into daily life, into the world, into the context that they live in, into relationships, into the ups and downs and the stresses they face in life and shadow work and, and all that stuff. Awesome. Um, I would I would love to kind of touch in on on uh, the second and third that you mentioned. Okay. I think yeah. uh, I I don't know if I can assume this. Everyone, please feel free to comment below. What what um, one two three? You can rewind and, and which which of the three mm -hmm. uh, are you most interested in? I I mm -hmm. imagine a lot of people watching, or at least some of them, have already developed some kind of um, meditation practice, or they've tried, <laughs> okay. at least, mm -hmm. right? Um, right? As myself included, uh, and and you know we're we're trying to figure out well what now, um, you know, and and also just as importantly, as you said, like how do we bring that into the world on a to, into relationships into our work etc yeah right day to life yeah yeah, yeah like work. like exactly. you can you can meditate all you want and, and still be a jerk <laughs> you know it's like right and uh you know is that is that an application of meditate you know, maybe i don't know so um so tell us about so this is interesting like there is a pathway i mean there is a, like mm. a blueprint for consciousness as you say yeah and there's a developmental progression of meditation um I, I you i'm sure we could talk about this for years but if you could summarize what that blueprint or pathway yeah, I looks I actually like for you can yeah you know all the different spiritual traditions you know the ones that have been around for thousands of years buddhist and christianity um, um actually i should say all of the mystical dimensions of these spiritual traditions because it's you know sometimes the spiritual traditions are just about preserving the dogma and passing on you know the traditions and of uh, and there's always that mystical core which is you know what what the real kind of deeper spiritual transformational practice is about all of the traditions usually they they usually have some type of map of how their practice unfolds um some of the maps are very general simplistic in a way other maps are super granular granular you know, they really get down to the details. Um, in the tradition that I come from, you know, the, the Mahasi tradition of Burmese um, Vipassana meditation, they work with the Abhidhamma, which is Buddhist psychology, and they use a, a, a map called the uh, Visuddhi Maga. And the um, Visuddhi Maga is the path of purification. And in that, in that practice, as you move through states of consciousness, over time, you know, incrementally, gradually, you'll move through 16 stages of developmental insight knowledge. The eye of insight will gradually open as you learn to practice, establish, develop, and um, and grow your mindfulness meditation. You'll move through 16 stages of developmental knowledge until you gain the path as kind of awakening experience. Uh, it's the end of the path, but it's not really the end because there's always, you know, there's always more practice. To go into that is really, it would be really kind of like getting into the weeds. So, um, I, I think it's better to speak about, you know, there, uh, the blueprint of consciousness is something very easy to understand. You know, if you think of the, 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 that samsara, the life that we live is a prison. These maps from the spiritual traditions, they're the escape plans for the prisons. You know, they kind of show us the blueprint on how to, to get out, even though we're not really moving out. We're not like, we're not, you know, escaping a prison. What we're doing is we're, we're practicing, we're establishing mindfulness meditation or awareness or presence and the process unfolds in a way that follows pretty much all the maps a much more easier map to understand is is from the the early zen tradition um uh, the five stages of uh of, oh my god i just forgot his name i feel horrible tozan the five stages of tozan chinese one of the chinese patriarchs and um and he says that, that spiritual development, and this actually applies to kind of those three stages that I just spoke about earlier, the nuts three stages, the three things that I do with people. First is seeing the absolute in the relative. So we're in this kind of relative world, we're going around, we're learning how to manage and, you know, and grow and kind of discover who we are. And we have some type of transcendent experience, you know, some type of unity consciousness or whatever there's an awakening and maybe it's through another person or through, through an experience it could be through an intense difficult experience it could be meditation it could be with drugs even but something awakens and it's like oh my god there's a bigger reality here but it's a fleeting experience it happened and it's gone but that's an important first step that's the first stage in the five stages of tozan second stage is we learn uh, so awakening uh, sorry taste 
respecting the absolute in the relative. Okay, so we live in the relative world, we taste the absolute, we get a glimpse. Second stage is establishing the absolute in the relative. So that's the stage where we take on practices. We hang out with communities and maybe teachers or, or guides or different traditions. And we take on practices that help us where it just doesn't happen to us, but we learn how to access the deeper spiritual experiences by ourselves. And that could be, you know, a 10 year, pro it could be a lifetime project, you know, but it is, it is quite a process. So that's um, establishing the absolute in the relative. Awakening the absolute or tasting the absolute in the relative, establishing the absolute in the relative. And then when that, when this kind of establishment, this practice stage matures and reaches its peak, it's kind of like the top of the mountain, we're resting in the absolute. So we've we, we've created the ability to just rest in, 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 you could call it absolute love, you could call it unity consciousness, you can call it emptiness, you could call it the state of perfection, whatever it is, but we're able to rest there. Top of the mountain far away from all that nonsense that's happening down at the bottom of the mountain, it's kind of liberation, it's free. But it's not the end of the path, it's just the third stage. The second stage, we have to come back down the mountain. Sorry, the, so the fourth stage, after we're resting in the absolute, now it's seeing the relative in the absolute. How do we bring this relative existence, you know, how do we, how do we, um, you know, after the ecstasy, the laundry, how do we, you know, deal with the kids? How do we, you know, run a business how do we have relationships how do we that's kind of the coming down of the mountain that's kind of the returning to the marketplace part of the journey and it's as arduous as the as the upward journey the return journey is is as tough and arduous as the as the first part of the journey and then the last stage is when relative and absolute are one and so just it's just all one so this this kind of this is like a very kind of classical you know the five stages of tozon is a classical definition of kind of how a person's spiritual practice uh, matures. Seeing the absolute and the relative, establishing the absolute, taking on practices, resting in the absolute. And then the fourth stage is seeing the, the, seeing the relative in the absolute, integration. And then that fifth stage is when, is when it's full integration, when absolute and relative are one. That's so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Really, go ahead. really cool. Yeah. And I, I love, I love this very simple you know diagram um and yeah and it's it, it's and, and well, it's enlightening that um you know i can imagine some people they 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 think that's it i'm i'm there i'm done and then they're not really applying it to their life and that's where we or, see yeah yeah or, or i mean some people think they're done it's very common in all spiritual traditions right the, to have a false awakening you know it's it's somewhere halfway up the mountain but and we don't have to get into the details of that but that's actually kind of part and parcel of the process that's why if you're working with a teacher working with a tradition they're going to actually kind of guide you through these potential pitfalls but the resting at the top of the mountain it is a noble thing to take off Become a monk or a nun the rest of your life, live in a monastery, live in the woods, live in the forest, live in the mountains. It is a noble thing to do, not to return to the marketplace. But if you are, well, certainly if you're a householder, um, returning to the marketplace is key. And you, one could argue that returning to the marketplace is really what humanity needs. We need, you know, the bodhisattva. We need that that uh, awakened mind back in the mix of things so we can, we can all kind of grow forward together. Yeah. Yeah, I, I you're you're right. I mean, because because everyone around me is a householder. <laughs> that's that's the experience yeah, I right, have. Me too. Right? Yeah, like, totally. It, every spiritual teacher that I know is a householder, and every spiritual, right. uh, even monks or whatever, whatever they want to call themselves, they have a business <laughs> or they have a they have they're in the world. They interact with yeah, them, and right. but uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. There are like um, people who are dedicated in 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 the monasteries and the caves that they yeah, are right. also helping yeah. to awaken you know humanity and and yet uh yeah everyone here listening watching we are we want to be enlightened householders or we want to be uh at least yeah, bringing, right. bringing really. more of the conscious um you know, you know the, the the more awake uh, a more awakened perspective into our day-to-day -day. so so talk about that a little bit here like I mean, you have your own experience of running a business or running a dojo, you know, leadership and uh, dealing with so many people. Um, I mean, this is a broad question, but how do you bring that 
on a day-to-day moment-to-moment basis in terms of your own spiritual awareness into the day-to-day like how how do you do it well you know it's funny because i spent 16 years out of society Mm. i was living in japan teaching i was teaching english about 15 hours a week wasn't much i lived in the countryside and i was training aikido full-time hardcore Wow. What, what, and what, back what, then, what area there was of Japan, no internet. By, by the way? The Ibaraki Prefecture. It's north of Tokyo, a couple of hours away from Tokyo, oh. countryside. Um, and um, there was no internet back then. Uh, I had a shortwave radio. After, after two years, I had a shortwave wave radio, no television, just living the life and training full time, reading a lot. Um, but but I was, I was kind of like a, a hermit or a monk. And then I spent eight years, you know, kind of dedicated to the Aikido path, to su- uh, sorry, to the meditation path, to support that because, you know, there were planes and there were donations to give after those long retreats. I traveled around and taught Aikido, but I was still very much, so I was in society, but I was still very much this kind of guy that no obligations in society for 16 years out of the world. And um, it be- and it went, because of that, It the practices I did went extremely deep. You know, I developed, that's my career is based on, that's kind of my my doctorate or my degree. But um, it was so clear for me that um, the work, the, the real work that I needed to do was to come back to society, to return to the marketplace. And that's when I began my integration work. So unlike the average person, they're doing meditation, you know, and and kind of, you know, doing the best they can. And then immediately having the application of it to their life with the kids, with the work, with whatever driving and traffic, like really like it's, it's a long, slow process, but the integration is happening from the beginning. In my case, the integration happened much later and it was a tough haul, you know, coming back and um, dealing with business, dealing with students, dealing with relationships, dealing with uh, financial stuff, dealing with, you know, all of the stuff that it means to kind of be a householder or a business operator, um, that was quite a, uh, a process for me. And it meant that I actually had to go back and I had to kind of clear up a lot of my issues around power, around money, around you know sexuality and relationships. And a lot of therapeutic work actually was done in there and coaching. And, you know, so, so that process, it became clear that that was just, even though it's so easy to bypass that and say, no, no, let's just go to nirvana. Let's just go to heaven. Um, it was so clear that, no, I will not be complete. I will not be an integrated human being. I will not be healed until I actually take on this this kind of, this, this work that is far from being spiritual. But it actually became the most spiritual thing I could do was to, you know, change the diapers. Yeah. You know, to clean up, clean up, the, to clean up the mess, <laughs> you know, take responsibility. <laughs> So yeah. I'm I'm not sure if that answered your question, but um... yeah, well, no, it's really it's really interesting. I mean, so so the development you had as um, basically a monk for all those years, right? Um, kind of, yeah, yeah. It's like in, in a way, it it made it tough to operate in society because of just the day to day logistics. Um, and the day I wasn't dealing with I wasn't in society. Dealing, exactly. Yeah, I wasn't operating in society. Yeah. And so, well, maybe, maybe tell us a bit about like what is your practice now? Um uh having done so much of it, do you do you, you know, have a morning, evening routine? Do you uh meditate in the middle of the day? Like what's what what what, what do you prefer? Well, that's actually a great question. So so my practice is much more spontaneous. Um, I, I, you know, when, when you're, it's, it's so important to take on routines, as you know, it doesn't matter if it's meditation or business or, you know, whatever, um, install some good habits and take on the routines and stick to those as much as possible. Don't blame yourself. It it makes perfectly no sense to judge yourself. If you're not, if you miss a day of meditation, or if you miss a week of meditation, if you miss a month, you miss a year. Okay. When you come back, you come back. That's all that, that's all that matters. Um, now, what will happen after a long-term practice is that those practices will start to become internalized. And at a certain point of internalization, you don't need the external discipline anymore. The discipline for me, if we talk about miles, is actually like in the middle of you know, doing the monthly uh, um, accounting 
when when I'm dealing with all that stress. The discipline for me is like, okay, how can I make this part of my mindful routine? Number one. Number two, how can I get better at dealing with this stuff? You know, skillful, like masterful. Because I developed this mastery in Aikido. I developed this mastery in meditation, more or less. I want to have mastery in all domains of life. So I would say that my, like Miles Kessler, my main practice right now is number one, um, developing mastery in my professional life. And number two, um, continuing to evolve my teaching, the way that I teach, the way that I work with people. You know, every time I sit and work with another person, that's it's like, okay, we're working on their development, but it's actually I'm developing myself as a teacher as a transmitter, as a communicator, as a, you know, as a, as a listener, as some, as an intuitive, you know, all of these things are happening. Uh, not only that, I'm also developing my ideas, developing, you know, what is my unique offering? What is my um, authentic expression of, you know, of these traditions that I've been deeply steeped in? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Wonderful. Um, and I, I want to ask, and then we'll start to wrap up, but I, I want to ask you about the that second question I raised earlier, the integral, uh, that word integral, yeah. integral dojo. Um, you, uh, yeah. I personally am, I'm fascinated, I'm a fascinated beginner uh, with integral. Um, I've like dabbled in it over the years. And, but I want to hear from you, like, what does integral mean for you um why is it important for you mm -hmm. well first of all what it, if, if you could describe it in your own words and then why is it important for you or how does it fit into your 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 world okay i'll, I'll try to i'll try to keep this short because it's it, it's a very very in-depth yeah. uh, <laughs> yes yes philosophy theory mm -hmm. um you know when i was a kid i loved maps you know i would read the hobbit or lord of the rings and i'd go back and look at the maps so many so maps and geography was my favorite class in school. And the maps, I just love maps. Anytime there's a map. I'm... So we were talking about maps and meditation. And, and basically, inter integral is a map of, of, um, of the cosmos as a human being, how we show up and how we can show up. And it turns out that the map is not so. There's kind of five basic frames that cover everything in the cosmos as a human being. And the first is... Um, uh, stage, stages levels, lines, types. First is states, like like um, that there's meditative states, what we've been talking about, that we move through different, deeper states of, of meditation. That would be our spiritual uh, maturity. The second is stages, that there are developmental stages of consciousness that we can actually see, take more and more perspectives. And as we mature, and this has, it, it, it as we mature, it gets more spiritual, but it's not really a spiritual tradition because as we mature, we're able to to have more care and each level of of uh, perspective. We're able to have more care and concern for the world. So we go from egocentric, just myself, ethnocentric to my people, world centric to uh, like I include all the people, all the colors of the rainbow. It's like I can bring them into to my embrace and listen and connect and have an emotional agility in in relating, and then all of uh, cosmocentric. So that's kind of would be stages. And there's developmental practices that that um, help that. Uh, state stages, levels, no states, huh? Uh, quadrants, stage, quadrants, levels, line states, types, sorry. Okay, so there's four quadrants. Again, I don't want to get too too in the weeds yeah. here. Um, but the there's, there's also types. Let's just say, the, I'll wrap it up with personality types, that there's types of people. And that if we really want to learn how to relate in human relations, we need to be skillful in relating to different types of people and also understanding our own type. Now, why is this important is because when my whole, basically my whole life, even since I was a kid, has been all around one practice tradition or another, sports, martial arts, Buddhism, practice tradition. And when I work with people, I'm actually working from a practice context. And there are three, if you want to have a, a, a um, and this is we'll wrap it up from here, the, if you want to have a balanced, integrated development, there's three basic practices that you need to work on, uh, three basic domains that are covered in integral theory. The first one is um, states, that you want to have some type of spiritual technology that, that, that kind of helps you go from an ego ex existence towards more of a spiritual understanding. The second one is stages, these developmental stages that I was talking about. You need practices that help you take more and more perspectives, 
you know, that you can put yourself with cognitive empathy in another person's shoes, really relate, get them from their inside. Um, and then the third one is shadow work, states, stages and shadow that we just need our own kind of therapeutic processes for the parts of ourselves that are disowned, wounded, mm. uh, dissociated, traumatized, whatever. We need to kind of bring those back in and integrate our own interiors. And if you're working on, if you have practices in the States, if you have practices in stages, and if you have practices in shadow, then your personal development will be an integral, will be an integral development. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. I know that was a, 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 a whole PhD, right? Like, that. <laughs> you know, yeah, a, maybe a bit off too much there. No, and, no, and maybe I mean, it's important to say if, if you don't fate, if you don't bring in state stages and shadow, if you're just focusing on one, your development will be very good in that one, but you're going to be imbalanced. Right. So, right, you know, there's is, a lot of spiritual teachers get in trouble because of their shadow. And, yes. Or yes. their issues with money, for example. So all right. that stuff needs to money, be integrated. Money, sex, et cetera. Yeah. Um, right. so that's amazing. I mean, that's why, you know, people, people, uh, can learn so much from you. Um, you have something called the meditation discovery cycle. That's like a, it's like a little, uh, like a 30 day or well, tell, tell us about that. And I'll, I'll put the link to that below. Yeah. The, 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 the meditation discovery cycle is my meditation membership program. I have a community and it's actually been closed for the past year. So, um, we have a pretty, pretty intimate group uh, committed meditators. We, we meet, um, you know, I meet, I get online with them, uh, twice a month. Uh, I also do once a month, I do a Q and a, but then I send out daily, um, practice videos, not daily, excuse me, weekly practice videos. So it's for people who actually want to, in, want to kind of integrate, uh, a meditation practice into their daily life. And it's called the discovery cycle because we take these different teachings and we move through them month by month. There's another theme, in fact, right now we're in the middle of the 10 spiritual perfections. So there's these different qualities that get developed as your meditation matures. And we're taking a theme per month. This month we're on resolution. Last month was, I forget what last one, generosity. And so we're working through these different. Um, and and I, I, I've, I'm i actually opening, just by coincidence that we're doing this, this meeting, I'm actually opening it up for the first time in a year. And I'm, I'm giving people a 30-day free access if they want to come in and try meditation they can come and join and and meet the community meet me get the practices and uh see if this is a, if this is for you yeah and, um and and it includes some time some q a time with you as, as part of that right yeah yeah well there's we, we do two um every two weeks we meet online uh for like a, a, a meditation session where i give a little bit of a teaching we sit together and then we do some a few questions but then also once a month there's a there's a q and a session where we get and i just take everybody's questions and we stay you know it's usually about an hour but i stay along until all the online until all the questions there's also a group of meditators that meet daily online and meditate together so Amazing. any of your your audience who might be interested in in joining us you are most welcome to uh, yeah to pop yeah in. Awesome. 30, 30 day access to try it out. Um, the link is below. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, I think you'll enjoy that program as well. Uh, Miles, thank mm -hmm. you so much for the work you do and how you do it. Thank you. Yeah. Likewise, George, I actually, I, I really enjoy your, your work as well and your content and, uh, and you're helping me more than you know. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.